Welcome to the Local Insider Podcast, a show about everyday people who make a big difference. Dr. Monty Ashley, welcome to the show. Thank you, Brian. It's my pleasure. Pleasure to be here. Pleasure to see you again. It's it's an it's an honor. Um, um one of the uh reasons I have you on is uh we we were discussing before how Hollywood has really um failed us in the in what we call role models and the youth today are kind of put them up on a pedestal and they're they've been led down the the wrong path and uh, so one of the, the purposes of this show is to uh, let people see what good role models are, people that have fought in the trenches and have uh, been been through the fire and have made it through successfully on the other side. The show hopefully will give them a place to turn to and see what it looks like, and, and, and maybe they can learn some skills or get some insight on how they should uh, model their life after or who they should model their life after. Um, so with that said, uh, uh, what's your story? Where, where are you from? How did you get started? Wow. Well, born in California, my parents went out there uh, for my dad to try to find work. Uh, it was during difficult times and uh, he thought perhaps he could go there and find work. And he did. Uh, he operated a dozer on an orchard. And uh, so I was actually born in California. But, uh, you know, before school age, my parents moved back to Oklahoma. And I actually started school in Oklahoma. We lived in Oklahoma City at the time. And um, so that's where I got my start. I grew up in Oklahoma and uh, attended school in Oklahoma City, as I said, and um, just kind of went wherever my parents went. Mm -hmm. You know how that is. But um, I followed my dad into an area that we both had an interest in, uh, which was martial arts. Mm -hmm. uh, for my birthday, he uh, signed me up for classes back in Oklahoma City, and he was uh, already a student at that school. And it was Bob's Judo and Karate School. Wow. <laughs> and uh, what a name for a martial arts school. <laughs> uh, but it was simply uh, Bob Willingham, and he ended up being a legend in Judo worldwide. Right. And so I uh, got a good start in the martial arts. He was a black belt in Judo. He was a brown belt in uh, a form of Karate, or Karate as we say in Arkansas. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I got to learn a mixture of both. Uh, the reason my dad decided to do that is um, I was small uh, for my age and just really couldn't defend myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were a lot of bullies at that time, just like there are these days. Right. And so I was a, a victim of bullying. And um, my dad got tired of me getting beat up. Mm -hmm. And he decided to do something about it. And so he enrolled me in martial arts classes, and uh, some fond memories are he and I training together when I was little. Oh, wow. And, uh, you know, that was exciting for me. It didn't stop the bullying. However, it did make me more successful in defending myself against bullies. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the bullying, of course, continued. And so I had lots of fights growing up. <laughs> and, um, you know, the martial arts is about self-defense, but... Uh, when you have to defend yourself, you do what you have to to stop someone else from hurting you. Right. And I was able to do that. I wasn't being hurt anymore. Mm -hmm. Except by the principal. <laughs> <laughs> we had a, a principal that uh, reminded me of the old Mr. Clean commercials. Great big bald-headed guy with huge arms. And boy, when his paddle would be swung, you could hear it whooshing before it hit you. Yeah. One day he told me, there were 800 kids in my class, and he knew by, me by name. And that was not a good thing, Brian. <laughs> he said. Why do you keep getting in these fights? And I said, Mr. Berger, I never start one, ever. He said, well, you realize I'm just doing my job. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, grab your ankles. And wish here it came again. Wow. And my parents uh, finally moved me out of Oklahoma City. It just was not 
a good environment to raise children. Mm -hmm. And they moved me to a small town called Willica, Oklahoma. Willica. Yes, land of the running water. Mm -hmm. And uh, population 1,400. And there were a whopping 52 kids in my graduating class. Wow, then. that was a culture shock there. Going well, it was. Um, they moved me in December, even before the semester was out. And so I show up in this black leather motorcycle jacket with long hair, slick back. <laughs> Got in a fight first day of school. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. Um, but that was uh, life-changing for me mm -hmm. because... Country people were just more friendly. They were more accepting. Uh, they weren't out to get you. There weren't many bullies in school. It just so happened I ran into one the first day. Mm -hmm. And since I was the new guy, right. I guess he had to check me out. Yeah. And uh, I remember I was in my English class, the first day of English class. And Mrs. Hamby was the teacher, just a wonderful person. I'll never forget her. And uh, the school was so old, there were radiators in the classrooms. Mm -hmm. And so it's in December, so I'm over standing at the radiator before class started. I had my hands over the radiator, and this big fella named Jesse came over, pushed my hands down on the radiator. Oh, man. And so I just turned around and knocked him out. He hit the wall and <laughs> slid down the wall, and I went over and sat down at my desk. No big deal, you know. <laughs> and uh, Mrs. Hamby turned around, and, what happened to Jesse? <laughs> Well, nobody said a word. Uh, they, I think, were just afraid mm -hmm. that I might retaliate if they did. And when I would walk down the, the hallway, people would walk to the other side to keep from passing me. Right. And uh, so that was not a good feeling, but at least I wasn't being bullied anymore. Right. And I, I, I wasn't a bad guy. I looked like a bad guy. Black leather jacket. Yeah. Hair. Uh, I I joined uh, FFA, mm -hmm. and my instructor, uh, again, a, w a wonderful fellow, Mr. Hodgins, he uh, said, I'll, I'll trade you an FFA jacket for that motorcycle jacket you wear. And I said, deal. And we traded. Now, eventually, yeah. he gave me my jacket back. Mm -hmm. But uh, he gave me an FFA jacket, which was pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, you know, it was a good place to grow up, like Boonville. Right. You know, small town, good people. Uh, I discovered church. Mm -hmm. We uh, lived on a farm, but on the corner of our farm was a one-room church, a Free Will Baptist Church, that uh, people that owned the farm before we did donated the land to the church it was built on, and as long as they held church there, the land belonged to the church. Mm -hmm. And my neighbors, who lived across the road from me, a quarter mile down a dirt road, a dirt driveway, uh, came over one day and asked me to go to church with them. And I said, well, I'm not really a churchgoer. And they said, yeah, they were in my bedroom talking to me. And uh, my guitar was in the corner. And they said, you play the guitar? And I said, yeah. And they said, well, grab your guitar and bring it to church. You can play the guitar in the church. I said, really? And they said, yeah, you sit by the piano player and play the guitar. I said, wow, fantastic. And I did. And we sang a song that I'll never forget. And it has, in large, determined the way I live my life. And it was count your blessings. Count them one by one. Count your blessings when the day is done. Mm -hmm. And I've tried to do that all these years. And as a matter of fact, I created a 12-step plan for defeating depression. And one of the 12 steps is... Count your blessings when the day is done. If you don't recognize them and appreciate them, it's like they never happened. And so I carried that philosophy all these years and still practice it. Right. Yeah, that's one one thing I've learned. I've, I've listened to uh, all the Internet gurus, Tony Robbins, all these, these people that talk about uh, uh, success peddlers is what I call them, uh, which a, a lot of what they say is true. and gratitude being one of those anytime oh, yeah. you you're feeling down and you think that you know you've been given a raw deal or you're angry uh if you can change your mindset over to one of gratitude then your brain cannot be angry and grateful at the same time that is true so that is absolutely true so yeah i agree i agree 
how did you get from was is it Willica 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 uh-huh. Oklahoma to Boonville? Well, a long road. Um, I continued my martial arts study during that time. Uh, my dad just started uh, a passion in me, and uh, I wanted to continue that. And so um, I would drive to Okmulgee and Tulsa, Oklahoma to uh, train with a man named uh, Lou Angel. And I trained with him all through the 60s. I became an assistant instructor under him, and I was allowed to have my own class. And there I was, 13, 14-year-old kid, teaching a group of adults martial arts. Wow. And so I I appreciated the faith he had in me. Uh, He was a wonderful man, recently died. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd been affiliated with him all these years. What discipline did he teach? He taught goju, goju. Uh, which is, was a, a Japanese form of karate. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's an Okinawan goju, and there's a Japanese goju, and he taught Japanese goju. And he was head of the uh, Midwestern Goju Karate Association, so all the middle states. Uh, he was the man. Mm-hmm. So to be able to study with him and work out with him was a, a real honor. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, He's the one that gave me my last promotion, and uh, before he died. Wow! And uh, I was I was so really, full circle. Yeah, it sure That's was. Amazing. So, what was your first black belt in judo? No, I I was just a kid when I uh, did judo. Back then, you didn't see five year old black belts walking I around. See. Okay, <laughs> and so um, yeah, you just didn't see anything right. like that. And uh, as a matter of fact. Uh, in Goju, the youngest you could be to even test for your black belt was 16. Oh, I see. I can remember bugging Mr. Angel uh, because, I, boy, I was ready. I was ready. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I wasn't old enough uh, to have my black belt. And I, Mr. Angel, when can I test for my black belt? When can I test for my black belt? And I remember uh, we were wearing our geese, our uniforms, and our belts. And he took off his black belt and handed it to me. And he said, if you think you deserve to wear this, put it on. And I, I declined. But, wow, what a lesson. Yeah. What a lesson. I'll never forget that. Another time he called me into the office, and uh, it was just an honor to be in his office. Because mm-hmm. that was private, you know. Only the black belts got to go in his office. <laughs> And he said, uh, you know, you started with me way back when in the children's class, and everybody quit but you. He said, I put you in another class, and over time, everybody quit but you. He said, I put you in an adult class, and everybody quit but you. He said, you're running off all my students. (laughs) (laughs) That's one way to look at it. I was in shock. And he said, I'm kidding. He said, I'm kidding. He said, "Uh, I wrote a letter for you to your parents about you. And I would appreciate it if you'd give it to your parents. And so I didn't open it. I took it to my parents. They opened it. And it was him giving me accommodation for the hard work and the dedication and the discipline that I showed. Wow. And, uh, boy, that meant the world, meant the world. Even though you weren't old enough to get your black belt, right. <laughs> you, you know, he went above and beyond to write that letter to yes, your parents. he did. He did. Um, how many black belts do you currently hold? Well, I have a black belt or a black sash in nine different styles of martial arts. Um, I've studied Okinawan. Japanese, Northern Chinese, Southern Chinese, Indonesian, Filipino, uh, Korean, uh, two different styles of Korean martial arts. Uh, I've studied uh, martial arts from a lot of different regions. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can always learn something from someone else. Mm -hmm. You know, there's an old saying, you have to empty your cup before you can taste my tea (laughs) or appreciate my tea. And... uh, so I would put on a white belt again and go into a school and train up in their techniques. Didn't take them long to figure out I was a black belt in another system. And uh, I ended up uh, 
teaching a lot of the teachers that trained me in their style. Mm -hmm. I ended up uh, teaching them techniques from my styles that I had learned. Mm -hmm. And so it was a good trait. It was a good trait. And uh, so. So I understand you, uh, you made your own style out of all of these different. I did. Uh, uh, practices that you studied. I I was taking two Kempo styles, uh, both Okinawan Okinawan styles, and I combined their techniques. But I combined techniques that I found to be useful in every style I had ever studied, and there were useful techniques in every martial arts system. And so uh, I combined all of those techniques and created uh, a new system of Kung Fu in which I had combined techniques from Northern style Kung Fu, uh, Kung Fu, and Bruce Lee style Jeet Kune Do. And uh, I took all the Japanese, Okinawan, Korean, and Filipino styles I had trained in and combined a new Kempo style. Uh, Kempo was one of the first arts that originated in China, migrated from China to Okinawa and, and started from there. But uh, I was still affiliated with uh, Mr. Angel. And I had earned a high rank in uh, the Kempo styles and the other styles. And fifth degree black belt is the highest level where you test, mm -hmm. where you actually do a physical test. Uh, the promotions after that are time and grade. And uh, depending on what you provide to the martial arts, what you give back to the martial arts. And so I went to Mr. Angel and uh, I, I told him, what I had done, and he looked at all my materials. He looked at my videos that I had done of myself. He went over all the techniques, all my manuals that I had put together, and he uh, accredited my two styles of martial arts. And in doing so, then that legitimatized them. Right. They were considered legitimate martial arts. And, uh, I feel like I, I did a pretty good job because I had a lot of information to draw from. I had mm -hmm. a, a wealth of knowledge that I had learned from so many other great instructors. Uh, so many people influenced my life in the martial arts. Um, I kept the classical forms from the, uh, the Kung Fu and from the Kempo. And so I left those the same. Mm -hmm. uh, that's history. That's tradition. That's art. Mm-hmm. And so I, I didn't alter those. But the fighting techniques that I combined at the time was probably one of the most complete martial arts systems, period, because it addressed every other style, and it also addressed numerous situations, the what-ifs. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, that's uh, common. You know, you you see people now, and they'll uh, – that know that, – don't necessarily know anything about martial arts and they'll see someone doing kata and they're in the horse stance. And like, right. Somebody could easily kick them right between oh, the legs. Absolutely. And, and I'm like, you got to understand that this is a, this is a form of art with your body. Yes. You're symbolizing fighting on horseback. Absolutely. So, absolutely. So your styles would maybe incorporate like fighting from setting down in a car. Fighting and, from setting down, fighting from the ground. Uh, my system had a lot of grappling techniques which uh, MMA has really brought that to the forefront, mm -hmm. uh, especially uh, Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, uh, UFC champion, mm -hmm. Gracie. But um, my system of martial arts had that already. And uh, those techniques came from Judo and Jiu-Jitsu and the original Kempo. Mm -hmm. So I had grappling, joint locks, chokes, throws, sweeps. You know, it, it was all combined. Uh, I'd still teach all the traditional ancient weapons, including the uh, samurai sword, uh, kenjutsu and aijutsu techniques. And uh, I had earned my black belt level in the samurai sword. It doesn't make me a samurai, but uh, I still practice those ancient techniques, and I teach those ancient techniques. But uh, all the Okinawan weapons, I would practice all of them and teach them. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I would also do uh, the Filipino-style martial arts, knife and stick fighting. And uh, so... Pretty complete martial arts system. Uh, like I said before, Mr. Angel died. He promoted me to the highest level of martial arts uh, in my systems, mm -hmm. and which made me 
a grandmaster. Uh, Mr. Angel was a great grandmaster. Right. And uh, I became a, a grandmaster under him, uh, receiving my 10th degree black belt and my 10th degree black sash. He had formed an organization called the National College of Martial Arts, and any martial arts style was welcome. And it was a large brotherhood and sisterhood uh, of martial artists from all over the world, all different styles, different backgrounds. And uh, we would meet every year for an international martial arts championship. And when, after he promoted me to my 10th degree, I competed my last time. And I hadn't really competed in about 20 years. <laughs> it had been a while. But um, I wanted to show him that he didn't misplace his trust uh, in me mm -hmm. and his belief in me that I, I could still do it. And uh, he wasn't sitting in on the, uh, the board, the testing board, but um, other high-level black belts were there. Uh, I participated in what they called the master's division. And so you had to be a fifth degree black belt or above to compete. And the judges had to be a seventh degree black belt or above to be on the judging panel. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was so funny. Uh, my wife, who has studied with me, but uh, she told me one time, she said, you know, I don't love martial arts. I love a man who loves martial <laughs> arts. I said, well, okay. And so uh, she doesn't necessarily practice or try to work towards her black belt. Uh, but uh, every women's self-defense class I go, she attends and practices and, and helps me teach the classes. And uh, she knows how to defend herself. That was the big thing. But she came up to me, and there were about 25 competitors that I was going against. And uh, she said, do they give a participation award? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, <laughs> they do not. This brings me to one of the points I was going to bring up, um, how the difference uh, our society is, how different our society is from the way it used to be in the way, you know, things specifically in the martial arts. Um, there's many sports out there where you get particip participation trophies, you get medals and all of this just for the mere fact of being on the team. Uh, your story... Uh, about not being able to even test for your black belt until you're 16 kind of uh, demonstrates life in that some things will only come with time and wisdom, you know, and you have to achieve certain things to gain certain honors. And so I, I think that's, uh, that's one of the things that uh, kind of jumped out at me when you were telling your story of there's no shortcuts you know, you you took the long, hard road to do do the work, and you know, and in turn uh, receive the honors as such. Well, it was worth it. Mm -hmm. It was well worth it, and uh, I wouldn't change any of that. You know, uh, the study of martial arts has blessed my life in so many ways. Uh, it gave me the courage to. Be the best that I could be. It gave me the dedication to never give up. It gave me the discipline to, no matter what obstacle I was faced with, to go through it, over it or around it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I, I think a lot of my success in life is attributed to the martial arts and what I learned from childhood up. Mm -hmm. about myself, about what it takes to succeed. Uh, it gave me a, a very good understanding of human nature and what makes people tick. But it gave me a, a great understanding of who I was and who I am. Mm -hmm. And I, I still practice martial arts today. And uh, a famous... Uh, athlete. He was actually an exercise guru, a fellow named Jack LaLanne. Mm -hmm. uh, he died in his 90s in the hospital because he had gotten pneumonia in the hospital. 
But uh, he was still working out a couple hours a day up till that. And he once said, the only reason you get where you can't do something anymore is because you quit doing it to begin with. He said, so don't quit. 100%. And that's my philosophy. I don't quit. I can always do something. Is he the guy that um, they would show him? They would uh, on TV. He was like swimming and towing boats. And yes, stuff, and he was in his like seventies, seventies and eighties. Yeah. He every year for his birthday. Yeah, and until you know he just got into his nineties, I uh, would do something phenomenal mm-hmm. just to draw attention to being healthy. Mm-hmm. And uh, I can remember watching his show when I was a kid with my mom, and she would do his exercise program. That was in the 50s. <laughs> he had the first TV exercise show. Wow. And, uh, you know, it was just phenomenal. And my mom would be lifting those cans of beans and <laughs> just working out. And uh, I'd work out right along with her. I had my cans of beans, That's and awesome. I would just do it too. And uh, he was quite an inspiration. That's um, What is your balance between, uh, you know, you only have a certain amount of time in a day. So uh, as far as your training regimen, how much time do you devote to skills, technique training versus physical fitness? How do you balance that? Well, I, I try to do something on a daily basis. I still lift weights. Mm-hmm. I have a program that I put together that I do. Uh, I combined dumbbell exercises with a bow flex exercises, and uh, so they're safe. I'm not lifting any heavy weights by myself. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not using a spotter or anything. But I've got a really good routine that I do total body workout. Uh, I continue to do my stretching exercises to keep my body limber. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, stretching is really important. I, I still practice the martial arts. Uh, I've got a heavy bag in my garage, and I roll it out and do my punches and kicks, and uh, I still practice my forms. I have a mukjong, which is a wooden dummy, Mm -hmm. and I have that in the garage, and I I try to use that at least three or four times a week. There's actually a form that's called the uh, mukjong jong fa, and it's got 116 sets of movements in it, and so I practice those. And it kind of keeps me sharp with those kinds of moves. But, uh, you know, martial arts is a lifelong endeavor. Mm -hmm. Uh, I learned meditation from my Kung Fu master, Master Ng. Uh, I became an instructor under him and his style of Kung Fu. And uh, I learned about energy force in the body. Master Ng came to the United States to teach acupuncture to veterinarians. And he taught at a university, and I heard of him. And uh, I'd been in martial arts for several years at that time. And uh, I heard he was an authentic kung fu master from China. So I kind of had to see that. Right. And sure enough. Acupuncture for pets. Yes. Yes. It's amazing. And he taught us acupressure and how to flow our chi, Mm -hmm. our internal energy. and. so, learned a lot from him. Uh, I learned a lot from all of them. They all had something to contribute for me to better myself. And uh, so, I, I just have a, a grocery list of martial arts instructors that uh, taught me, I trained with, and uh, benefited from. Mm-hmm. You mentioned the wooden man. Um, uh, it's I think it's most as- commonly associated with Wing Chun. Yes. Is, was it the first art to use the wooden man or was it the one that you well the Shaolin temple had uh, kind of a testing ground uh, to become a Shaolin monk Mm -hmm. uh, they had to go through a chamber of wooden men and uh, some of them were like booby traps things would swing it at you and you know you Mm -hmm. had to defend yourself uh, going through this this hallway of assailants right and they were wooden dummies Wooden men. And so um, it, I think it got its start there, but the Wing Chun wooden man was, is very unique. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was not like what they practiced on. But So I think the concepts were around even before Wing Chun. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, Yip Man, uh, Bruce Lee especially, uh, really promoted the use of that and made it 
Okay, that's kind of a popular thing. Right. And until uh, you try to use one, you know they're not soft wood. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Well, in Wing Chun and Jeet Kune Do, we would we would practice a technique called Sam Singh, mm -hmm. which is arm banging <laughs> to toughen up your forearms. Right. And uh, the the wooden dummy, wooden man would would definitely help you toughen up your forearms because you're going in and you're blocking and striking. Uh, arms mm -hmm. and uh, leg and the trunk itself, of course, is the body. And uh, in doing that form, it toughens up your arms. It turns them into wood. Yeah, pretty much. I've I've seen people end a fight by just blocking a fight. Somebody yes. injured their throw up a haymaker and they somebody block it with in their forearm right. injures their hand. Or Absolutely. Their, their... Absolutely. So. And uh, I trained in a Muay Thai. Mm-hmm. And I trained with a couple of fellows that uh, came over from Thailand. And at the time, my dad owned a Harley-Davidson dealership, and I was in partnership with him on that. And uh, the young man came to Okmogi Tech, which now is OSU mm -hmm. Tech, and uh, to train in uh, motorcycle mechanics. And one of them hired on with us as a mechanic uh, doing his residency, okay, for school. and. Uh, they taught me Muay Thai and uh, a great sport and devastating. Right. And their arms and legs are so conditioned that, like you said, they use them as blocks. But when they do, it's used as destruction. Mm -hmm. uh, I can remember Tom. His name was Carnage Papa. And uh, we called him Tom. <laughs> <laughs> he came up with that. <laughs> But he'd sit around with a glass Coke bottle and beat on his shins just to make sure they stayed tough. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't choose to do that. Right. <laughs> but anyway, so I learned some good things from them. And uh, we traded techniques, and it was a lot of fun. So I got to do some Thai boxing. And that's rough stuff. Mm -hmm. It is rough stuff. But, uh, you know, the MMA has kind of done what I did. Uh, their competitors take what they consider the best techniques to do what they need to do. And they really, the MMA, the UFC, they brought grappling to the forefront. Mm -hmm. Before that, it wasn't really seen as a very good martial art or a very good self-defense technique. But grappling is very important. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the fights end on the ground. And uh, so the difference in what they do and what, what I do is when we grapple, we break bones. Right. We break joints. Uh, we choke people unconscious, which they use chokes also. But, um, you know, where they don't damage the joints, that's a legal technique. Mm -hmm. uh, we go for the knees. We, of course, attack the groin. But if we go into a grappling situation, one way to stop someone from hurting you is to remove their weapon. Mm -hmm. And if that weapon happens to be an arm, and, you know, I'm not trying to promote violence. Uh, my my saying is don't fight. But if you have to fight, do it right. You protect yourself where you won't be hurt. Right. And uh, so that's what we trained for. So Bruce Lee could have been seen as one of the first MMA practitioners. Right. Because he, in, in creating Jeet Kune Do, uh, did a lot like I did studied all the different martial arts from the time he was a child all the way up until he came to the United States to live here. Mm -hmm. uh, he was actually born in the United States in San Francisco. Uh, his parents were in an opera group, Chinese opera. And uh, while they were here, here came Bruce. Hmm. Uh, Li Jun Fan is his real name. and But they gave him an American name of Bruce, Bruce Lee. And that was on his uh, birth certificate. And so when he came here, he was a citizen because he was born here. But he studied Kempo with Ed Parker. He studied uh, different grappling styles. He studied different styles of karate and uh, kung fu and gung fu, besides what he brought with him in the form of Wing Chun. Mm -hmm. And Bruce's idea or belief was that if you have to fight, get it over with. Right. If you have to defend yourself, stop the person as quickly as possible from hurting you. Because if you prolong it, most likely you're going to get hurt. Right. So Jeet Kune Do is based on 
how can I stop this person as quickly as possible from hurting me? Like he says, the art of fighting without fighting. Yes. Yes. And uh, uh, did, did you know he had a degree in philosophy? Um, he got it from Berkeley. Is that where he got it? Well, he uh, originally attended uh, a university in, in Seattle. And uh, that's when he started creating Jeet Kune Do. Mm. Now, I studied Oakland-style Jeet Kune Do uh, under now Grandmaster Gary Deal. And uh, he also, I learned Kempo from him. He was also a Kempo instructor. And he was an old Goju man also. Uh, he grew up under Lou Angel, too. And so we kind of knew each other. And when I found him, I really wanted to learn Jeet Kune Do. Uh, I got to see Bruce Lee one time uh, when I was a child. I was in martial arts. So I had a real interest in martial arts and uh, had heard of Bruce Lee. And uh, there was a Jerry Lewis telethon in Oklahoma City. And my aunt was working there, working the phones. And uh, she was telling me about a man that was going to come named Bruce Lee and be there as a celebrity. And so I said, well, can I go? Can I go? <laughs> can I come see him? And so uh, she let me come with her. And I got to see Bruce Lee in person. Wow. And which was pretty phenomenal. And uh, wasn't a very big guy, but uh, he asked for a volunteer to come out of the audience. And there was a brown belt in karate. I remember he, he said he was a brown belt in karate. And Bruce told him, he said, well, okay, attack me. And the man said, well, what with? He said, I don't care. <laughs> whatever you like and so the man attacked Bruce and Bruce just obliterated him hit him and kicked him so fast so many times just touching right you know no hard contact wasn't trying to hurt the man and the man was helpless to do anything about it the man would attack him again he would trap him and tie his arms up and tie his legs up and I thought oh my gosh I've got to learn that mm -hmm. and so when uh, Gary Deal came back from Oakland California he was discharged from the military. Uh, he opened a school, and I heard about him, and I had to I had to learn, and so that was my opportunity. And so Bruce was in his early stage of his evolution of Jeet Kune Do. Uh, he started it in Seattle, and then continued evolving in Oakland, mm -hmm. and eventually moved to L.A. and uh, which is the Jeet Kune Do of today. Uh, he and a, a man named Danny Inosanto created the Jeet Kune Do that everybody's familiar with today. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of his final pro product. Uh, I feel like if he had lived, uh, it would have continued to evolve. And so he's been credited with being the first real MMA fighter right? because he did everything and he adapted to the situation. And so I took those ideas and uh, added them to what I did. And what I do, and so had some really great opportunities and some really great experiences. Like I said, I'm I'm very blessed to have been able to do that. So, what does the future of martial arts look like? You know, I think MMA is uh, something that's going to be here. Uh, even though it's a sport, it can be used as self defense. It combines the best of many things, and some of your best MMA fighters were not only grapplers, but Kempo or karate stylists or kung fu stylists, boxers, and so um, they are willing to grow and evolve, mm -hmm. and if they see something that works, they adopt it. Right. And, uh, you know, that keeps things fresh, keeps things young, and uh, keeps things interesting. So I think that will be that system will be around for a long time. I hope my system is. Uh, we're down to one school now. Uh, the other schools have closed that were kind of scattered around the country. But uh, we we have a school in Fort Smith, mm -hmm. and one of my students he's been with me well over twenty years. He's a fifth degree black belt, Dan Smith, magazine boy, and uh, Dan started with me uh, when I was teaching in Boonville. And uh, so he's been with me a long time. Wow. But he's got a great school up there. He teaches at uh, River Valley Fitness. And uh, 
he does an excellent job, and especially with children because he teaches values and ethics, Mm -hmm. and he teaches kids how to control themselves, how to control their emotions, how to not be affected by bullying, how to discipline themselves, to show honor and respect. And uh, the parents absolutely love him. And uh, he even gives workbooks and handouts to the parents to work on these things, these techniques, at home with the kids. Mm -hmm. And he tests people on specifics like, how good is your respect? And they can earn a pin that they can wear on their uniform that they passed the test for respect Mm -hmm. or courtesy, kindness, politeness. And so um, we continue teaching those values and those ethics that are so important right? that aren't necessarily taught in school anymore and sometimes not taught by the parents. I think that's one thing that's missing from the current MMA in, in that if you are a child or an adult, you go to MMA class, you have an instructor, they're going to teach you grappling. They're going to teach you striking, kicking, grappling. What is missing is the philosophy, the lifestyle of what martial arts is. It's a way of living. Yes. And you don't learn the the principles that I've heard you say throughout this conversation with respect, um, honor. Honor is a big thing. That I mean, there. I would argue that eighty percent of the people don't even know the the concept of honor. They don't know the definition of honor. Now. And um, perseverance, you know, diligence, that's, that's what you won't learn there. You'll learn technique. You'll learn how, how to do a, you know, a triangle choke and all the locks and all that, and you'll get really good. But what's missing is what you're, and, and you don't, and you're seeing that in the MMA fighters that are yes. come up and that they act more like professional wrestling where it's performance art instead of, a martial art. You know, and that's unfortunate. Uh, they don't necessarily have the traditional teaching. Mm-hmm. Uh, I did have all the way up. Mm-hmm. And uh, I credit my personality to that. Uh, that training. Not indoctrination. Mm-hmm. It's teaching. Right. Uh, when I was teaching the public, uh, my students would come up to me and give me the the covered fist, a sign of respect, or they would bow, a sign of respect, and they would say, sir. And when they would respond to me, they would always say, yes, sir, and no, sir. And I would always respond that way to them. To me, respect needs to be earned. Mm -hmm. I I realize we need to respect positions, like if someone's a teacher, we need to respect that position. But to me, respect needs to be earned. And just like anything else in life. It needs to be earned. Uh, I believe in giving people a hand up, uh, but not to the point it becomes a hand out. Mm-hmm. Uh, people need to learn how to fish. Mm-hmm. So don't just give them the fish. Teach them how to get their own. And so, you know, that was a parable that so profound and so true. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of parents don't, prepare their children for adulthood. They don't give them responsibilities and let them earn more responsibilities growing up. They don't have chores. Uh, They don't have responsibilities around the house or at school. And uh, I think that's a real disservice to the kids. Mm -hmm. Uh, Children are going to project what they learn from others. And to me, the parents are their most important role models. And so they're going to learn what the parents are teaching, Mm -hmm. whether the parent realizes they're teaching that or not. If you yell at your child, you're teaching the child to yell. 100%. Um, I think what you said kind of points out the fact that our culture, and this is something that you have in martial arts like you said you had to be 16 to even test to be a black belt we our culture has no rites of passage so a boy doesn't know when they become a man so you're 18 you can enlist in the military that that's not a rite of passage Uh, you get privileges of an adult but there's no 
There's no ceremony. There's no there's no ritual. There's no rite of passage to where once you cross cross this, you're now a man. Yes. And I think that it when you don't have that, it it will undoubtedly come to a head. And I think it's it has. You know. You know, uh, even our black belt ceremonies that uh, I still conduct, it's a rite of passage. Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't mean they've arrived and they're done. That means they're just beginning. Right. And uh, we have certificates and a certificate ceremony. We have a belt presentation ceremony. Uh, I present them with the samurai sword, and we do the traditional presentation of the blade. And then we seal it with a sake ceremony. And uh, one of my one of my students, who's now a world famous martial artist, uh, recently posted on his Facebook that uh, there he was getting his first degree black belt from me when he was 16. And he said, yes, I'm drinking sake. And yes, I was a minor. <laughs> <laughs> and so I contacted him. I said, you just had a taste. We didn't even fill your cup. <laughs> well, if the Catholics can do it, so can the martial arts. <laughs> you bet. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what does your day look like when you you wake up at 5 a.m. and start start your day or do you sleep in every day what what, what does your day look like well uh i'm not a morning person but uh, i'm still working mm -hmm. and uh i i retired and then so many people wanted to still see me that i came back to work and so mm -hmm. i'm working three days a week so i usually get up about six thirty and start my day and uh i'm at work at eight o'clock and i return phone calls on the days that i work and i go through my files and i look at what I did for a client last time, what my goals are, and then I come up with a game plan of what to do this time, unless they have something specifically they wish to address. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm a very action-oriented therapist. Mm -hmm. uh, let's get some work done. Let's make some change. Let's make a difference. And that's the way I approach things. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not a therapist that says, and gee, Brian, how does that make you feel? Okay. You know how you feel. There's no leather couch in the equation. No. Well, yes, uh, I do hypnosis, too. I do, oh, okay. <laughs> I do hypnotherapy, too. And so, yeah, I have a leather couch for that. <laughs> anyway, but uh, I don't use hypnotherapy so much anymore. Uh, I used to use it to help people heal from their trauma. Mm -hmm. But it was a slow process. I, I could only desensitize them to one trauma at a time. And a lot of people have literally had hundreds of traumas in their lives. Mm -hmm. And um, I found a new technique, a new therapy. Uh, when my son died, uh, I was in pretty bad shape. And uh, I just wasn't doing well, Brian. I, mm -hmm. I didn't handle it well. I, I know all the words to say and all the things to do. The old physician healed thyself. Uh, I, I just couldn't get past it. Uh, I don't know if you knew, but uh, I was a professor of psychology and counseling. I trained therapists, and uh, I'm still a state supervisor. I supervise new therapists for like a two- to three-year residency program. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I went to a couple of different therapists that I knew did good work. They'd been my students. They'd been my supervisees. I'd known their work for like five years. And so I went to a gentleman who's a, a fine therapist, and uh, he couldn't help me. I went to a young lady that. Good therapist. Couldn't help me. Uh, all the medications in the world didn't help me. I, I found that I, I turned to drinking, and uh, I would numb myself. Mm -hmm. And one day, my girlfriend, who's now my wife, uh, was worried about me. I wouldn't answer my phone. I wouldn't answer the door. She came over and rang my doorbell for 45 minutes until I finally gave in. <laughs> By that time, I had lost around 30 pounds Good great. because I wasn't eating. She opened my refrigerator, and there was a fifth of 151 rum. I don't know if you know what that is, but pretty potent painkiller mm -hmm. and a cold glass, and that's all that was in there. And she opened it as a brand-new bottle and poured it down the sink. And I thought I, thought I was going to come unglued. Uh, I would never, ever be violent towards my wife. I, I don't even yell at her. I mean, mm -hmm. that. That's just not acceptable behavior in a relationship. 
But I did my share of yelling and walking around and cussing, mm -hmm. just not at her. I didn't direct it at her. She said, you're killing yourself. And I said, you're right. I am. I have to quit. And so that ended my 151. But a couple of years later, we got married. She married me anyway, even though I felt I was broken. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was in despair. I have a depression inventory I use for folks. If you score 28 or above on it, it's severe depression. I scored 56, if that tells you anything. Wow. I got where I could compartmentalize it and still do my job. I could go to work and do my job. But anything could trigger it, and I would just be devastated. Uh, anything could trigger it. And um, one day I went to a workshop on complicated grief because I had diagnosed myself. And I went to presenter at break, and I, I told her, I said, I have complicated grief, and I'm not doing well. She said, well, tell me your story. And I did. And she said, yeah, you have complicated grief. And she said, you need EMDR. It's the only thing that will heal you. And I said, I beg your pardon? <laughs> <laughs> we don't heal people. We give them coping skills. Right. You know? We teach people how to think differently, to feel differently, to behave differently. And... um she said it louder. She thought I didn't hear her. <laughs> she said, you need EMDR. It's the only thing that will heal you. And I said, okay. I said, well, what is EMDR and where do I get it? And there was none here mm -hmm. in Arkansas that, that she knew of. And I didn't know of anyone. I'd never heard of it. And so um, she recommended I go for a training because we would practice on each other in the training. And so I found a training in Tennessee. It was uh, $5,000. That included hotel and everything, mm -hmm. but still, that's a lot of money. Right. And it was not taught in any university. It was only taught privately. And um, I told my wife, I said, I, I found something that might help me. It's a training. We practice on each other in the training. It's called Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing, EMDR for short. I said, but it's $5,000. And she said to me, I don't care if it's $50,000. You're going. And I did. The first few trainings, uh, we were told to pick something not really traumatic to work with each other that we could get our feet wet. So when I was eight years old, I drowned. And... Uh, a man found me floating face down in the motel swimming pool, pulled me out, did CPR, saved my life. And so my parents, feeling guilty because they went back to motel room, left me in the shallow end of the pool on my floaty. Mm. I went to sleep, floated out in the deep end, couldn't swim a leg. So and you were eight years old? Yeah. Because of their guilt, they put me in every swimming class every summer, all summer long. And I was so terrified, having panic attacks, which I didn't know what they were, that I would just cling to the side of the pool in terror. And so I was determined to beat it. I took every swimming class known to man. I took every class in college. I took certified scuba diving. When I did my deep water, open water dive, I had a panic attack, 125 feet underwater. Oh, Needless to say, I survived, but I had my doubts. <laughs> and so I worked with Marie from Cincinnati, Ohio. She was my training partner. And I helped Marie with something that happened to her when she was very young. And the wonderful thing about EMDR is I didn't have to know what happened to her to help her heal it. Mm -hmm. It's not talk therapy. And so I helped her, and it was pretty intense. She cried and sweated and shook, and by the time we were done with that session, it was gone. It was over. So she asked me what I wanted to do, and I said, well, when I was eight years old, I drowned, and now any time I get in the water, I have panic attacks and flashbacks of me drowning. She said, gosh, don't you have anything easier than that? I said, well, one time I was riding my Harley and I got hit by a diesel truck. She said, no, 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 no. <laughs> She said, let's, uh, let's just do the drowning. <laughs> and we did. And I came home that evening. It was on a Sunday night in July. And I hugged and kissed my wife. And I went upstairs and I came down in my swimsuit. Now, I hadn't had it on since college. The miracle is it still fit, Brian. <laughs> Martial arts training, see? Yep. But uh, she said, what are you doing? And I said, follow me. We had a swimming pool I had never gotten in. 40 feet long, nice pool, 10 feet deep. Well, I knew every stroke there is, you know. Mm -hmm. 
And so she went out to the pool with me. I dove in. I swam 40 feet. I got out, dumped in again, swam 40 feet, sat on the bottom 10 feet deep. And I got out, and she said, are you okay? I said, I'm perfect. She said, no panic? I said, no panic. No flashbacks? I said, no flashbacks. She said, what in the world happened to you? And I said, EMDR happened to me. This stuff works. And it does. The final training, I went to my instructor because Marie, when I told her why I was really there, you know, I was being selfish. I wasn't really there to learn to help other people. I was there to get help. Mm -hmm. I said, Marie, I, I, I came because I lost my son, and I'm still grieving. These years later, I'm still grieving. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine. There's, there's no time limit on grief, let me tell you. And she said, oh, no, I, I don't think I can help you with that. She said, I, I don't feel confident in myself to help you. I said, you got to help me. This is why I'm here. This is why I paid this $5,000. <laughs> she said, I'm sorry, I can't do it. So I went to Roy Kiesling, my instructor, and what a wonderful man. Uh, I told him what was going on, and he said, if you'll stay after the training today, I'll help you. And he did. And we started, and three hours later, of him doing this, I motioned for three hours nonstop. He didn't do it on me the way he trained us to do, 20 or 25 passes. What are you getting now? Well, tell me about that. Let's go with that. He didn't stop for three hours until I told him it's gone. I don't know how he, his arm was going to be. How in the world could he do that nonstop for three hours? But he did. And he knew that the pain that I was suffering was intense. Mm -hmm. Ryan, I felt it leave me, buddy. I felt it leave my body like a thousand pound weight lifted off me. There was no more depression, no more despair, mm -hmm. no more rage, no more guilt. I'd have flashbacks of every time I ever got on my son about anything. And it caused me tremendous guilt. Mm. It healed me. Thank God. Because I prayed to God so many times, God, please. He'll made this mm -hmm. pain. So he sent me to that workshop, and she sent me to Tennessee. And fortunately, I was working with a, an instructor that was kind enough to help me. Mm -hmm. He could have just blown it off, said, well, you need to find an EMDR therapist. But he hung in there with me, and it was healed. That's amazing. So EMDR, I don't use hypnotherapy anymore to to address someone's trauma or their grief and loss, EMDR will heal those things. And sometimes in one session, it's phenomenal. So what all would it help with? I know, I know trauma helps. Trauma? I've, I've, Any I've kind been of a trauma. witness of, you know, I'm, I've been a direct witness of somebody that it helped with past trauma. And it, it's like you said, it's like they go in with this baggage, they come out. And they're not carrying it. It's just gone. It's true. Yeah, it is true. I get to witness miracles every day at work. It's only three days a week. But <laughs> um, what it does is a woman named Francine Shapiro created EMDR. And uh, she discovered it by accident on herself. Uh, but she figured out that eye motion back and forth, back and forth, back and forth could help calm someone down. Well, through experimentation, she figured out what she was doing was activating the REM state of the brain, the rapid eye movement state, which controls all of our memories. When you're in the dream state at night, your eyes are going back and forth under your eyelids. You're processing your memories from the day. Well, she figured out that she could have someone focus on a painful memory, a painful experience, and using eye motion to activate and control the REM state they could be relieved of it. It literally transfers. It processes. God created us to heal. Mm -hmm. When something bad happens, it's first registered in the emotional side of the brain. And over time, it processes on its own. It, it moves to the left side where it's stored, in the unemotional side. Mm -hmm. And that's a pretty basic description of what happens. But more or less, that's kind of what happens. Uh, a lot of factors go in. A lot of different brain activities occur. but we're transferring data. We're transferring those painful memories. And I discovered a, a technique that is literally 10 times faster 
and just so effective and so efficient that I'm able to accomplish really amazing things with God's help. I mm-hmm. pray for every person that I right. do MDR for, uh, whether they're Christian or not. It doesn't matter to me. But I had a guy op- open his eyes one day. You, with my technique, you do it with your eyes closed. And I had my eyes closed. And he said, Doc, Doc, are you asleep? <laughs> I, said, I said, no, no, I was praying for you. He said, oh, okay. He said, I'm sorry, please continue. <laughs> he said, I need all the help I can get. And I said, you and me both, buddy. That's why I call on God to help. And so you said you devised a, a method of this that works better than the original method. Um, I'm not saying it works better. It, it's faster. Fast, okay. Uh, I have discovered that there are certain steps I don't need to address. Uh, EMDR is an eight-stage process. I don't need to address all those stages. But I've also de- discovered ways of quickening those stages where they occur rapidly. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it's it's still EMDR. I'm just not using eye motion. I use pulsers that pulse in someone's hands, and it bilaterally stimulates each hemisphere of the brain, which activates the REM state. And all they have to do is be willing to face whatever has caused them the pain, mm-hmm. and not for very long. Like you said, the person you know came in carrying this burden and left it there when they when they left. The burden was gone. It was like a light switch. Absolutely. And I get to see that every week. You know, like I said, I retired. Uh, I don't really have to work anymore. I got that wonderful public school retirement Mm -hmm. plan, you know, (laughs) and so uh, I choose to work. And so people say, golly, how long have you been a counselor? I said, well, I started in 85. And uh, they said, have you ever burned out? I said, never, because I love what I do and I get to see the results. Mm -hmm. And it's it's important that I continue. And so, no, I, I don't experience burnout. Uh, a lot of therapists burn out early, and uh, I teach classes on how to prevent that. Uh, recently, I gave a presentation to a group of medical providers on how to heal from their burnout. And uh, we need those people. We don't need them burning out and getting out of the, the profession. Mm-hmm. We need good therapists. We don't need them getting out of the profession. What is your opinion on medical doctors treating people with mental issues like depression and it seems it seems like that if someone goes to a medical doctor the medical doctor will say they maybe have a checklist that they've got they and, sure. and, and then they say okay you will try this prescription yeah and they give them well and a lot of problems are genetic they're inherited and so uh once those genes are activated they they don't turn off and so they have physical symptoms that cause mental health issues, okay, Mm -hmm. Uh, like mood swings, uh, an imbalance of the neurotransmitters in their brain, Uh, you know, and all kinds of things can happen. Uh, It affects their rational thought and uh, really can affect their choices. And medications can control those mood swings to where they're not so intense that they cause people mental illness, Mm -hmm. okay? So medications are definitely needed. Um, What I try to do uh, when I work with someone like depression, if they have depression, now if it's familial, if it's genetic, and everybody in the family's had depression, and it's recurrent, it keeps coming back, then they're probably going to need some form of medical treatment to be able to deal with the symptoms. If I can help people heal from whatever caused the depression and continues the depression, then they don't necessarily need those medications. Mm -hmm. But that's something they should discuss with their provider. I don't recommend anyone ever cold turkey quit anything. That's just not a good idea. Uh, But medications are often necessary and life-saving. And so... A lot of medical clinics, a lot of providers refer their patients to me and to our clinic, and they send them everywhere, not just us. But uh, they do that because uh, people can benefit from therapy. They say medication is 50% of it and uh, therapy is 50% of it. So the combination of the two 
you're going to have pretty good success. Mm -hmm. And so um, the problem is people aren't real compliant with their medications. Right. And so uh, they get feeling better and then they quit. Well, the problem is uh, a lot of times those symptoms will rebound and come back with a vengeance, uh, especially if it has to do with their neurotransmitters and uh, brain functioning. So um, not a good idea to quit your meds just because you feel better. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to know for sure that the problem is resolved. Now, a lot of times I can do MDR for someone and help them resolve their past pain. A lot of times when you help them heal the past pain, there's no present pain. And so I've I had a lot of folks that scored high on a depression inventory, uh, even in the severe range. And after EMDR treatment, uh, I reassess the depression to see where they're at because I've created treatments for depression and anxiety and panic, uh, and they're very effective. And so if they still have depression, then we start treating their depression. But a lot of times that depression's gone, and they're so amazed when they take the same inventory they did before, the same assessment, I don't feel this way anymore. Mm -hmm. And they really don't because it was the past pain causing their present pain. So needless to say, I'm a big EMDR fan. It saved me. I had a woman yesterday say, you saved my life. And I said, well, I can't take credit. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I can't take credit. Uh, but I've witnessed it. I'm, 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 a, uh, I'm a believer. You know, I, I've seen it. I've seen it work. Well, I've done it, yeah. <laughs> and so I know it works. And, uh, you know, there are certain medications that interfere with the MDR, and I, and I advise people of that before we start doing the MDR so that if they're doing any of those, they don't do it that day. Mm -hmm. And uh, that way it, it, nothing interferes. We can tap in where we need to, and we can get the work done. So it's really phenomenal. But I've still got my leather couch. <laughs> <laughs> Once in a while, someone wants to come for some weight loss or stop smoking, something like that. I still do that stuff. I, I did a session yesterday for a young lady who wanted to lose weight. And so I helped her get on the road to do that. So what what does that look like? Do When um, hypnotism, you know, we have the Hollywood version where they have the swirling black and white thing or right. the stopwatch. The pendulum, sure. Yeah. Uh, Initially, that's what was used to control the REM state, to put someone in a deeper state of relaxation. Now, EMDR is not hypnosis right. in any way, in any way. Uh, and I've done both. I'm licensed. I'm certified in both. So I know what I'm talking about. EMDR is not hypnosis. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't use a pendulum anymore. I just talk them into a deep state of relaxation. And, you know, I... I started hypnotherapy as part of my doctoral program in psychology. And uh, when I finished my degree, I, I joined the American Psychological Association, and they have a division for hypnotherapy. And so it's often used in psychology. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I wasn't groundbreaking and innovative in that. It, it's often used. And uh, so I continued my study and uh, became a hypnotherapist and licensed through the Arkansas Board of Counseling and Marriage Family Therapists and with that. And so that's one of my specialties. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm internationally board certified in EMDR. I'm a member of EMDRIA, which is the International Association for EMDR Therapists. And uh, so I'm pretty confident in myself and what I do mm -hmm. with that. And uh, when you join an organization like that, they require that you continue to get CEUs, continuing education units or credits. And so that way you stay sharp on your skills. Right. And so that's, that's a good idea. So that's why I joined a professional organization. So who would you say has been the most influential person in your life? Wow. God. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had so many wonderful people influence my life and give me direction and help me to overcome. But uh, I always rely on God. Mm -hmm. And uh, he hadn't let me down yet. I mean, even though I didn't feel he healed me at the time that I was praying for healing, 
Heal my heart. Heal my mind. Uh, he directed me towards that workshop. Mm -hmm. I just came across it by accident. And I thought, hmm, maybe I ought to go to that. And uh, that put me on the road to being healed. Mm -hmm. So I even give him credit for that. Amen to that. So what are you excited about right now? Man, I'm excited about every day. Uh, I look forward to every day. Uh, my wife and I have the most amazing, happy relationship. I, I look forward to coming home and seeing her every night. And, uh, you know, that we don't have to do anything. We can just be in the same room, and it's just comforting. And so, you know, I, I look forward to seeing her every day. And uh, I think she feels the same way. But uh, I look forward to helping other people. But like today, today's my weight workout, and I'll do my weights and my stretches. After I leave you, uh, I'm going to go work out. And uh, tomorrow is my martial arts day workout. And so I look forward to those, and uh, I'm thankful I'm still able to do what I need to do mm -hmm. as far as martial arts is concerned. It's not an easy uh, way to stay in physical, good physical condition. Uh, you have to work at it. Right. And uh, so you have to continue. And so I do. Now, I don't focus so much on jump spinning heel kicks anymore. <laughs> but uh, Can you still do the splits? Pretty close. <laughs> pretty close. Uh, I I fell down a flight of stairs. Oh, man. Uh, we had a housekeeper. It's a really nice lady. And we had wooden steps. And I got up one morning and came out in my socks, which I never did, but I did that day. And she had waxed the stairs. And we had a long stairway, and I went all the way to the bottom. Mm. And I tore my shoulder out because I grabbed the stair rail. And I broke my leg in two places and tore all the ligaments in my ankle. And so I'm still recovering from that. Mm. I had shoulder surgery, and uh, but the ligaments are still healing. So right now I'm cautious what I do. So the splits are out right now. Yeah. Okay. I would I would imagine so. Yeah. Uh, if I go down too low on that ankle, boy, the pain. And, but uh, I'm not going to quit. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to quit. So I'm still working at it. But yeah, well, she apologized and apologized. And I said, hey, you know, things happen. Mm -hmm. uh, you didn't know. And I definitely didn't know. I said, please don't ever wax stairs again. <laughs> please, please get that wax off my stairs. Yeah. And don't ever wax those stairs. Don't wax anything on this wood floor. Don't just don't wax it. <laughs> so, Lesson learned. Um, you being licensed in hypnotherapy, is there any legitimacy to the the people like you see on TV, like past life regression under hypno, hypnotism, or yes. what do you think that is? Uh, I'm not sure what it is. I have accidentally done that. I would be taking people back to the what's called the initial sensitizing event, the initial trauma. And I would take them back in time, and I would have them describing what they saw. And three times that took them back past their current life. And they were able to describe their surroundings, what they looked like looking in a mirror, uh, what they were wearing, the clothes at the time, what they did for a living. Uh, they were able to describe those things. Hmm. Is it real? I don't know. Uh, when I was getting my doctorate, I, I, one of my classmates was Dr. Benjamin. Uh, he was a Jewish man that converted to Christianity, and he had a doctorate in theology. And he was working on his doctorate in psychology. And he could read and speak Hebrew and Greek. And we talked about the Bible when we'd have a break. And uh, he pointed out some differences in the Hebrew version and the King James version. And so I asked him one time, I said, what's your opinion of reincarnation? He said, it's in the Bible. Hmm. And he showed me. And I'm thinking, wow. And so, I don't know, Brian. Is it possible? I think it's possible. 
I've witnessed it three times. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I had a fellow try to take me back one time, and uh, I didn't go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I went back to when I was a little kid, but uh, that was about it. And so I've never experienced anything myself. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what it was. So what's your strangest experience of uh, in your in your travels at all in martial arts or in your um, mental health or therapy field? Well, uh, I studied under two people that I I trained in Reiki. Are you familiar with mm -hmm. that? Okay. And uh, when I was attuning in Reiki, the, the Reiki master told me I had the strongest key force that she had ever experienced, that internal energy. Mm -hmm. And I studied with, with two men in that area. Uh, master George Ng uh, taught me about chi. Uh, Dr. Rodney Sikronoski taught me about ki. And uh, Lou Angel did did also, what, like when I was 13 years old, I was putting my fist through five inches of board, mm -hmm. and a 13-year-old should not be able to do that. Right. And so I was using internal strength to be able to do that. And uh, so uh, Master Ng taught me how to flow my energy into someone else. Mm -hmm. And that's what Reiki is. You're flowing healing energy, mostly from celestial energy, into a person to help them heal. And when I would help people with Reiki, they would tell me that they would feel this tremendous heat coming off my hands, but I wasn't touching them. Mm -hmm. It wasn't laying on of hands. It was I was flowing my energy. So I would be maybe this far away from someone. Under Dr. Sikarnoski, he taught us to flow our energy into someone else as a weapon. Mm -hmm. Like and, the Shaolin Kung Fu. Yes. And so uh, one time, and this sounds crazy, I'm not lying, right? I'm not lying. I was able to force somebody over, not knock them down, but force them backwards by flowing my energy without touching them. Hmm. My hand was in front of them. And I I came home. I remember telling my brother about it. I was so I was so excited, you know. And so um, he said, "Well, he said, you know, I've never doubted you, but you got to show me that." <laughs> and so my brother was a large man. He was stocky. Uh, he was a real mountain man. And uh, I did the same technique on him, but he didn't step back or go over backwards. And I said, well, I felt like it was working. I felt that burning sensation, that tingling. I said, but I guess it didn't work. He said, it did. He said, you hurt my chest. <laughs> he opened his shirt. And this is the truth. My handprint was on his, on his chest. It was red. You could see my fingers and my thumb. And I had not touched him. Now, to be honest with you, that frightened me. I thought, I could really hurt someone with this. And so I quit practicing that technique. Mm -hmm. But that was the most amazing thing I had seen in martial arts, being able to flow your energy into someone else for healing mm -hmm. and for destruction. Right. Fortunately, it didn't cause my brother any internal injuries, and I'm glad for that. But I quit. I didn't practice that anymore. Right. I watched a documentary on the, the Shaolins who practiced the – I guess it's Qigong or yeah, yeah, and you know they will take a drill and put it to their temple, a power drill like an impact, and it won't penetrate the skin. They'll they'll pull a car with a string attached to an unspeakable part of their body without any any injury. Yeah, and when they interviewed them and they said, "Can can the lay person learn this?" And they said you, it takes a lifelong training. Yeah. If you try to learn um, on your own, and it's it's uh, very dangerous. You could rupture, uh, like I think he said, like aneurysm or damaged nerves in your body. Um, so you know, with, with Doctor Sekernowski, like I said, we use key as a weapon mm -hmm. of defense, but also use key internal key 
to protect ourselves. Uh, I got where I could take full power blows to the throat, to the solar plexus. Uh, we could take kicks to the groin. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had a demo team. I was not on the demo team, but they did a presentation for the Dallas Cowboys. And they brought the biggest guys they had. And one guy, my size, he took four blows to the throat at the same time from four of the biggest guys on the team. Nobody heard him. Uh, Herschel Walker uh, kicked a guy in the solar plexus and in the ribs. No effect. No effect. No damage. Hmm. Uh, the, their place kicker kicked a guy in the groin. No, no cup. Mm -hmm. And no damage. No effect. No pain. And so it's a real thing. Mm -hmm. The key and chi is, is a real thing. And uh, it, it does take years and years of practice. Like I said, I had practiced for years before I was able to actually flow out enough force to move someone. Mm -hmm. But after I hurt my brother, like I said, I, I stopped. Right. And got spooked. Got spooked. Yeah. I did. I wouldn't want to accidentally hurt someone seriously with that. Now, can anybody learn it? I think so. Mm -hmm. If I can learn it, anybody can learn it. And we would practice the techniques to learn those things, to do those things. Mm -hmm. uh, the first time Master Ng introduced me to chi, flowing my energy, uh, I was one of five instructors. There were five of us that taught all of his classes. He had 200 students. And so he'd walk around looking important, which he was important. But uh, And then he would teach us privately and cook for us after class. We'd go to his home, fabulous Chinese cook. So I got a great meal for my efforts. Yeah. But then he would teach us, just the five of us. So he's teaching us about flowing your energy, the concepts of, of qi. And we, we were having a hard time grasping. And so he stood up. We were in his kitchen at the table. He stood up in front of his china cabinet and had dishes and cups and saucers in there. And he closed his eyes and he held up both hands. And the china started tinkling. Tinka, 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 tinka. The china was rattling. And I looked to see if he was shaking his leg or, you know, what, what the, what's going on here? And he was not. Uh, you know, scientists call it telekinesis. Mm -hmm. He called it flowing your chi. And that was pretty amazing. So the most astounding things I've witnessed in martial arts have been internal energy. Mm -hmm. And so I've seen people do incredible feats of kicking and breaking and you know, all kinds of physical prowess, but what impressed me the most was internal energy. Well, I bet I've never witnessed anything like that. I've, I've, um, I've watched the study, you know, the Stanford, uh, uh, or maybe he's at Berkeley. He's studying, uh, ESP or, or I don't think that's what he calls it. It's a different name, but he shows that, he can have someone in uh, a room. They, the two people don't know each other. He'll have this person look at a, an object, and he'll have the other person uh, like pick out which object it is. Yeah. And it's uh, you know it's not every time. It's not like, but it's uh, above the uh, realm of possibilities of how many times that the person gets it right. Right. Oh, the mind is phenomenal. Yeah, the mind is phenomenal. Um. They say that qi or chi comes from the lower part of the stomach. Mm -hmm. And so when we would practice, that's where we would start to try to flow the energy and flow it out through our bodies into something or into someone else. Uh, when you see people do astounding breaking techniques of boards or ice, uh, you see them slight meditation before they do that. Mm -hmm. And they're flowing that energy because. We're not that strong. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was a kid, I definitely wasn't that strong. Right, 13 years old. Yeah, five inches of board, no spacers, and we did not heat treat our boards. And uh, one time I hesitated and broke my wrist. So That one little glimpse of doubt. Yes, that doubt. And I lost my key and uh, broke my wrist. I hit it the same way I did every time, but I broke my wrist. And it's so funny. And then... Uh, I was on a demo team for Mr. Angel. And so he's, I came in with my cast. He said, he said, ah, he said oh, don't worry, don't worry. He said, you can break them with your elbow. <laughs> Use your elbow. 
So what uh, what advice would you give a young person now just starting their life, graduating high school, even about to go to college? You know, I, I believe education is the key. It doesn't necessarily have to be a college degree. Uh, I, I think you have to receive some form of training in order to move into a profession. I don't care if it's automotive profession. I don't care if it's psychology profession. But education is the key. Uh, when most people graduate from high school, unfortunately, they don't possess job skills. They may have had an agri class. Uh, they may have learned some welding, but they can't go out and get a job as a welder. And so uh, I would like to see more job skills taught in the high schools, but definitely more job skills available in higher education. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, your Votech schools are almost a thing of the past now. And that's really unfortunate. But uh, so, you know, we're going to work most of our lives. Some people don't work, but most of us are going to work all of our lives. And uh, I love to work. I prefer working. Uh, our our clinic flooded, and I was off work for three months. And, oh, my gosh, I, I figured out real quick, I, I don't want to retire. I'm not ready. Right. <laughs> and so work does something for you. It makes you feel better about yourself. A good day's work really increases the quality of the, the person you are, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And so I think work is very important. And I, I don't think people should shy away from it or not want to do their best. My dad once told me, he said, because I, I had a job that was pretty rough. He said, son, it all pays the same. You just make them a good hand. That's what you need to focus on. And uh, he was right. Okay. It's it's going to pay me. And so I need to do my best. And so I've always endeavored to do my best at whatever I did. And I think the martial arts really helped in that area. And I think kids today don't really grow up with that. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying they have to make straight A's in school. or, But you need to do your best at whatever you do. And that will set you on that path in your life. You'll continue that path. And so I, I think so many people have lost respect mm -hmm. and courtesy. Uh, my son was joking with me one time. Uh, my, my son Spencer does martial arts, and uh, he's very good at it. But he said, you know, Dad, I think courtesy went out when they stopped dueling. <laughs> and I said, you know, it probably took a hit. It yeah. probably took a hit. Even then. No repercussions. Yeah. And that's right. There's no consequence for someone's bad behavior or rudeness or causing harm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when they, when they came out with this mantra of defund the police, I'm thinking, how stupid can people be? No kidding. Because without limits... There'll be no limits to what people do. And the police officers are there to give us limits. Now, I don't like speed limits, <laughs> but I try to adhere pretty close. I don't drive dangerously, but uh, they're there to protect us, but also to encourage limits. You don't steal from people. If you do, we're going to put you in jail. Mm -hmm. You don't just haphazardly beat people up. If we catch you doing that, we're going to put you in jail. And so today with no cash bail, you just get out. And, you know, I went to D.C. recently and I was accosted uh, at the subway. And this guy came up and he was a large man and was demanding I give him my money. And I said, sorry. No. And he starts yelling at me and waving his arms around. He said, what do you mean, sorry, no? What do you mean, sorry, no? I said, no matter what your question is, the answer is going to be no. And so he tried to get in my face, and I got him out of my face. And he, I said, you need to walk away, and you need to do it now. And he did, and I'm very thankful <laughs> he did. That guy could really hurt me if he'd <laughs> wanted to. But... What is going on in our world, you know? 
I, I tell my clients, and I tell myself this, sometimes you have to shrink your world and just focus on yourself and your family and your friends, your job and what you can do, and do your best at those things because so often we can't affect the broader scheme of things. Mm -hmm. And in order to prevent that anxiety and that fear from overcoming us, sometimes we have to shrink our world. Mm -hmm. And so I find myself having to do that and not watching the news. And uh, so fortunately I didn't get robbed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So uh, how for people that may be interested in your services or getting in touch with you, how can they how can they reach out to you? Well, I uh, I founded a clinic in Greenwood. My wife and I did uh, called Stonehaven Behavioral Health and Wellness. She came up with a name. It's an old stone building. It's kind of a landmark, and stone means strength. Mm -hmm. Haven means a place of safety. And so she thought that would be an appropriate name for our business. And I've had a few people call and want to buy some rocks. And I told them, no, we sell mental health here. We don't, we don't <laughs> sell rocks. <laughs> but uh, so we founded Stonehaven. And uh, I've retired and then come back. So I'm only there three days a week. I, I sold the building to one of my therapists and my office manager, man and wife. And uh, they are good people. And I grew all the therapists there. Like mm -hmm. I said, uh, they're they're homegrown. They're like my kids. Uh, they were all my students, and then I supervised them for two or three years. And so I know their work, and I know they do good work. Mm -hmm. And uh, they've come into Stonehaven as independent contractors, and uh, all of us that are there are independent contractors. But uh, not everybody does my protocol of MDR. Uh, one other person, I've only trained one person in my protocol, and uh, the others do EMDR, but they do traditional, and it still works. It uh, just takes a little longer, but uh, mostly I do EMDR. Mm -hmm. I'm usually there nine hours a day, and I, I'll do nine hours of EMDR. And they can find the uh, the phone number on Facebook, I'm sure. It's sure. Well, the page. number is, uh, of course, 479. It, the prefix in Greenwood is 996 and it's 996 life that's 5433 okay and we have a wonderful office manager and uh, they can call for an appointment if they want to see me they can request me if they don't request me then she'll divvy out the referrals and the calls but if uh, someone wants a particular person they just call and ask to be referred to them and so if someone wants to see me then all they have to do is call very good doctor Monty Ashley, or as uh, I always knew you by, Shodai. <laughs> Thanks yes, for coming sir. on. Oh, my pleasure, Brad. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay.